women's attire and beautification. So everything in regards to that. So that goes to hijab, niqab, the types of clothes that she can wear, um, jewelry, makeup, uh, dyeing hair, plucking the eyebrows, everything that's basically uh, things that we love to do. Uh, and so it's really interesting. I, I have this uh, this book called Tahrir al-Mara fi Asri Risala. I mentioned to some of you guys in the first class that this is where I'm taking a lot of um, the information. It's a six volume book. So I thought I'm going to find a couple chapters on this topic. I'm going through chapter one, two, three. I don't find it at all. Finally open up, uh, sorry, I'm going through volume one, two, three. I finally open up volume four, a 300 page book. And the title of the entire book is Libas al Mar'a wa Zinatuha. The clothing of women and her beautification. So there's an entire, you could say, a 350 page book on the topic. So I was both excited and scared <laughs> that there's a lot to, there's a lot to go through. Um, but alhamdulillah, I, I really enjoyed reading through this and found so many things that I believe are very surprising and may change your opinion on some matters. And so just to give you clarification, uh, the scholar who wrote this book used uh, uh, the Sahih Ahadith from Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and then tafsir from different mufassirun to try to understand the ayat in, related, in relation to it. Okay, so begin. We'll begin with um, the covering of the woman, so the clothing of the woman. So uh, the scholars have determined from, based on the ayat and the ahadith that were mentioned, mentioned that there are really only four main rules in regards to a, the clothing for a woman. And these are vague, general rules. And outside of those rules, women have ability to, um, to, to dress as they please, based on their culture, based on their likes or dislikes. But as long as it follows these four general rules. And they are that, um, number one. Sorry about that. I'm that's fine. So the first one is covering. And what it is is that it covers everything besides the face and the hands, and according to the, uh, the Hanafi Madhab and other scholars, the feet as well. So everything is covered except for the face, the hands, and perhaps the feet according to the Hanafi Madhab and some other scholars. Along with that, they say they mention that it should be loose fitting and it should be it should not be transparent. Because if it is to cover, then transparent doesn't cover it. And if it is to be loose, uh, if it is to be covering, then it should be loose so it doesn't show the the shape of the body. Yes. Wait, there is some transparent. It's like kind of, but it like, doesn't really show the shape. Like you know, I mean, there's like different levels. Oh. So the best is to be the safest is so that it is not transparent. That if you put if you put your um, like your, what I always try is I put my finger underneath and can I see the color of my skin? Okay, so I look. Can I see the color of my skin? If, it, if I don't see it, and I only see the color of the material, then uh, it is not transparent. But if I see the, the color of my skin, so there is some transparency to it. You can wear something under them. If you wear something under them, then that, then that is permissible. And one thing we don't, remember, we don't realize is sometimes we're in our house in the dim light, and we don't see our skin. But you go out into the sun, and all of a sudden, that transparency really comes through. So you really have to be careful, because um, the, the, the objective is that a woman is covering her body, that she is not allowing anyone and everyone to see it, that this is something that is, that is hers to keep for herself and for those who, um, who, are, who have you know, done enough in, in their lives that they are worthy of seeing that. So her father who has taken care of her, her brothers who are taking care of her, and then eventually her husband who will be taking care of her. So those people are deserving of seeing that. Whereas other people who um, she sees that are, that are just on the street, strangers that she, she, she sees, they're not deserving of that. Like they haven't done something to be allowed to, to, to see that beauty. And these are some of the interpretations scholars have understood from it. Um, this, so the first was just covering and how covering, loosely and not transparently. Number two, um, that it is not an imitation of men. So it's saying clothes that are particular to men, that a woman is not wearing those clothes, so that it is not difficult to determine, is this a woman or a man? And the, similarly for men, men are not supposed to wear clothes that are imitating of women. Number three, that it does not imitate um, the disbelievers, 
in particular to what is in their religion. So if, if it is common for, um, um, uh, for priests or priestesses to wear a black, black attire with a white, white thing right there, that is a religious, religious dress of the Christian people, so we should not imitate that. So it doesn't go back to just not imitating them altogether, uh, but it goes, goes back to not imitating them in terms of their religious dress in terms of their religious dress. So if the, if the, if the Jewish men uh, wear the yarmulke, which is a small version of the topi, so ours should be different from that. And if the Jewish women wear something else, so our clothes should be different from that. We shouldn't be um, imitating their religious apparel. Okay? And then the fourth one goes to the concept that it should not be overly beautified. And what we'll find in a lot of, a lot of what we talk about here is what the, the scholars mention as i'tidal moderation. And we know that is Islam essentially at the end of the day is a religion that is moderate. So it shouldn't be something that is overly beautified that if someone if someone were to see that person in the, the streets, they would take a second glance, right? That is someone who has overly beautified themselves. Um, and then it also shouldn't be shouldn't be, and this is people's opinion if they want to take this opinion, that it shouldn't be something that is so uh, drab and ugly that you wouldn't know like is this a man or a woman like what 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 is this person wearing all together the prophet Sallam, even he entered uh, into um, the home there was a husband and wife there and the wife was wearing clothes that he he mentioned that they look like clothes like working clothes like you're out in the field and you're working and they've, they've gotten like dirty and they were they were they're not beautiful clothes so he said to her Masha Anuki like what happened and all she said in response is oh, my husband has no desire for the dunya, so <laughs> this is how I look. Um, but the Prophet mentioned, like he noticed that this woman is not wearing clothes that even at all have any beauty to them at all. So he was trying to see, well, what's wrong? What happened? So you could see in the, it was, it was a norm for women to dress, in it, and we understand that that is just a norm of women, that they want to dress beautiful, they want to be beautiful. Um, a man came to the Prophet and asked, um, there is a man who wears beautiful clothes and beautiful shoes. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allahu, uh, Allahu Jamal Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. So there's nothing wrong in that. But it goes back to i'tidal, moderation in, moderation in it. Okay. Um, so those are the main concepts, covering everything besides the face and the hands and the feet according to some. That in that first one we say it would be not transparent and it should be loose, not not uh, being able to describe the shape, just being able to describe the shape of her body, and then not imitating men, not imitating disbelievers, and not overly beautified. Okay, in regards to the hijab, in regards to what we today call the hijab, which is really we just call the one hair, the one uh, head scarf, the hijab. Um, there is. This idea that's come about, and I think it's only in the last recent, like I'd say, couple of decades, this idea that hijab has not been ordained by the Qur'an. Okay, and there's this argument that's put forth. So, um, I will explain where we do find it in the Qur'an, and it, t it requires someone to understand the words that are used in the ayah. So in the ayah, in Surah, Surah An-Nur, ayah 31, Allah says, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا And she should not um, expose her adornment, adornments except for that which appears normally thereof. وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُورِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ And that she should put her khimar, khumurihinna, this is the plural, she should put her khimar and drape it over her chest, drape it over her bosom. Okay, so then it goes back to the question, what is a khima? What is a khima? So if you look in the time of the Arab at that time, and if you also look in the dictionary, a khima is defined as a covering of a piece of cloth that was used to cover the hair and the head of a woman. Okay, so if it was a piece of cloth that covered the hair and the head of a woman, then the, and the Allah then tells women, then take that piece of cloth and cover your chest with it. Then we would understand that she would take that head covering and she would also drape it over her bosom, over her chest. Now, the argument is that, well, 
a scarf can be used for multiple uses, so maybe it's just saying to only cover it over the chest. And so my argument would, would be, I was trying to find an argument that makes sense logically, would be this. Um, and that is if we say like a principal of a school tells uh, that our children's dress code is that their pants should cover their ankles. Their pants should cover their ankles. Now my question would be, is that would we dress our children with pants and tie their pants around their ankles only to cover their ankles? Or would we say, well the pants naturally cover from here until the bottom and we'll make sure that it's long enough that it covers over the ankles. It goes back, it goes back and what's very important is to what is the definition of pants. Pants are those things which start around the waist and they go down. And they definitely cover the bottom and the private parts and area. And so, the argument that is made is that it's not that the khimar needs to cover the head, it actually only needs to cover the, the chest area. Well, the argument is, do you really know what the definition of khimar is? The word khimar, the, the root letters of it is khamara, which is the same as alcohol, right? So khamar means to cover, so for, to cover something. And the reason alcohol is considered khamar is because it covers the intellect, it, it clouds the intellect. And khamar, the, the same root letter is used for a horse, a horse's mane. So imagine you have like a completely white horse and he has this black mane. Where is the mane? Where is the area of his mane? It is from the top down, going down. This is the same root letter used for the mane of the horse because that would cover up his head and um, a little bit below his head. So the argument is that it's just a scarf. Does it necessarily need to be a headscarf? It actually necessarily was a scarf that covered the head. And then Allah made it, uh, asked for the women to do something further with it, take that same headscarf and cover it until it covers the chest area. Because what was common at that time is some women would wear the khima, but they would tie it behind their heads. And so their neck and their cleavage was even exposed. So not only just their, this area with clothes was expo exposed, they'd even have cleavage showing. And so that was not something that was considered modest dress. So Allah put the injunction that women should take that khima and also cover their chests with it. Okay. Um, in regards to the niqab, so uh, many, many scholars will say that the niqab is fard, it is wajib upon women, and other scholars will say that it is not. Uh, what is, it, at the end of the day, it comes back to a difference of opinion, that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, it is clear in a hadith that they, they would cover their faces. Aisha radiallahu anha mentions, we would, we would be on the caravan, and when a man would pass by, they'd take their hijab, they'd take their khimar, and cover a little bit of their face, cover their face with it. And then when the man would leave, they'd take it down. Okay? So this is something the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were told to do, they were made to do. And many of the women from the Sahaba also, emulating the wives of the Prophet, also took the niqab. And we say that that is a virtuous thing if you're trying to emulate the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and they are the best of women, so that is a, a, a beautiful practice to do. However, when it goes, when we're going to fiqh itself, so the evidences point towards that the aura of a woman, for example, in her prayer, is that she must not cover her face and she must not cover her hands. This is actually the ruling the Prophet ﷺ gave for women, that when you are praying, don't cover the face and don't cover the hands. And so the scholars who agree that a woman can show her face and hands, they say, well, the aura of the prayer, that is the that is the far, that is the wajib aura, and so that is also that should also be the same as the aura that she uh, would have outside of the home. And if a woman desires to cover for her face even more, then that is mustahab. That is a sunnah that she can take. But uh, but like I said, some will consider it wajib based on the practice of the women at that time. But there is also evidence from many ahadith that the women that there were women who didn't cover their face. That there were women who from the Sahaba who did not cover their face, and there are direct ahadith in regards to that. Okay, um, in regards to the feet, so this is a matter of ijtihad. So, so the there were some women who they didn't even have shoes, like women who were poor, they didn't even have shoes. So, a woman asked the Prophet Sallallahu "Is it permissible for my sister to go uh, on the street and she doesn't even have shoes at all?" And the Prophet ﷺ said, it's okay, let her go. Let her go if she needs to walk, let her ride an animal if she needs to ride. And so from what scholars interpreted from that is, 
she covers her body as much as she can, but it would be inevitable that when she's walking on the street, so some of her sh feet might show. And particularly if she's riding an animal, it's, it's obvious that perhaps some part of her feet might show. And so they said then that was mubah, that was acceptable at that time. But like I said, majority of the scholars actually say that a woman should cover her feet. And that goes back to the Prophet uh, uh, the hadith of the Prophet that Asma bint Abi Bakr, she walked into the home and she was not covering. And so the Prophet said to As Asma, this is the sister of Aisha, she said, Oh Asma, did you know that once a woman reaches puberty, she should cover all of her body except for this and this. And then it says, and the, the tafsir of the hadith mentions, and he pointed to the face and the hands. So that is where majority of the scholars get the face and the hands. Those who say the feet, that is a matter of ijtihad of some scholars, and we accept it as a valid opinion. And it is the official opinion of the Hanafi Madhab. Okay. As for the, the so the ayah mentioned, and وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا and they should not expose their beauty except for what is apparent from them. Much ijtihad came from this. So the scholars said, well, what does it mean except what is naturally already appearing from them? So the scholars who allowed a woman to show her face and her hands, they said, then that beauty which may be seen on the face and the hands. And this is where we get into makeup and jewelry, etc., and things all, all related to that. So what's interesting is, as always, there's a difference of opinion. Those who say a woman should not wear any beauty, jewelry, or anything on her face. Uh, but when it was asked of Aisha radiallahu anha, what did this mean? Illa ma zahra minha, except what apparently come, except what apparently shows. She said it is the the ring and the kohal of her face. So kohal was what you would consider today eyeliner, eyeliner on the the woman's eyes, and then a ring that she wore on her hand. And they said that. And that based on Aisha radiallahu anha saying that, then it was acceptable for a woman to wear um, some, some forms of makeup and some forms of jewelry on the, on the parts of the body where it was acceptable for her to show. In addition to that, they mention bracelets and bangles for women. And because there are direct ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ is walking and he sees a woman wearing uh, bangles made out of gold. And he says to the woman, uh, have you paid zakat on those bangles? Have you paid zakat on those bangles? And then they had a discussion. So this is something usually talked about in zakat, like gold and jewelry and do we pay zakat on it? But it, if you look in the nuance of the hadith, a woman is walking and her bangles are showing. And the Prophet ﷺ said nothing of the bangles in regards to them not being, uh, them being haram that she's wearing. So we say generally that um, if you take the opinion that she is allowed to show her face and hands, um, then it is allowed for her to have some i'tidal in terms of the jewelry that she puts on it. So rings and bangles that are not extremely overly showing, but those which are generally accepted that if a woman wore them, um, it, it beautified her, but it was not over extreme over beautification. So it's not something like this amazing neon one that flashes as she walks or something of that sort, which is really bringing a lot of attention to her. And there, so there are many uh, scholars of tafsir that had this opinion. And the, the, the book mentions about 13. And from amongst them is um, Al-Zamakhshari, uh, Al-Wahidi. Uh, Al and it is one opinion of Imam Al-Tabari. And he mentioned many more who all said that it was, it was permissible for a woman to wear things and jewelry and kohal and on her hands. They even mentioned henna on the woman's hands. Uh, they mentioned kohal of her eyes. They mentioned rings. And some even went further to mention um, this was Imam Ar-Razi, an amazing scholar of uh, tafsir. Imam Ar-Razi mentioned, he, he went on like, uh, like three, four, five items that I had, even, had not even expected. So he said, yes, the kuhul of a woman, the henna on her hands, the ring on her fingers, the bangles on her hands, the necklace around her neck, the taj upon her head, like they said, like the crown. So if she was to put some uh, beautification that had some... Um, rubies or jewels on her head. And he even mentioned there was, there was a jewelry they used to put on their shoulder that went down to the waist. And he said this is all according to what ma dahara minha. That as long as she's covering her body with all the, the, the correct things that she's supposed to cover and it's loose and not transparent. So what is the problem with her putting these extra pieces of beautification? Again, this is the furthest I've seen so the, and, and the earrings in her ear. 
and the earrings in her ear if, if, they, if they were to come out and show some beautification. So this is, this is an opinion that exists, and, but I would say a majority of those who allowed it mentioned only a few things, the bangles, the ring, the henna, the kohol. Okay? So that is what a majority of them uh, had said was permissible, and this was apparent amongst the Sahabiyat very regularly. It would mention the kohul of a woman, it would mention the bangles of women in, in a hadith, numerous a hadith. Um, in addition to that, if you go even further, and this, this is the thing I had never expected to see, was in regards to makeup, the women of the Sahaba actually had a type of makeup that was the color of saffron, a color of saffron. And so the women would often wear this, and it was pretty much a norm to wear. So much of a norm that um, when they were in a when they were in a state of um, mourning, so someone had passed away in their family. Um, so it was a norm for these women to wear it, so that. Uh, if someone had passed away in her family or her husband had passed away, the Prophet ﷺ said, in that case, do not beautify yourselves. Do not beautify yourselves. So that means it was the norm that they would wear this, and then it was out of the norm that they wouldn't wear it. And some of the, the Sahabi had even mentioned, and again, these are just mention, mentionings in passing. So there was um, uh, one of the women, I believe, Zayna bint Aslama was her name. I'd have to double check for the name. Um, yeah, Zainab bint, As, bint Zainab bint Abi Salama. So it is just mentioning generally in the hadith that she didn't wear, she wasn't wearing any kohol, she wasn't wearing any beautification, she wasn't wearing the the, the 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 yellow on her on her cheeks. And then it said because um, her brother had passed away, and she said after the third day I made sure to put the the yellow back on my cheeks because I wanted to make sure I followed the rule of the Prophet ﷺ that I should not beautify myself for three days. So to show a difference is that on the th after the third day, she put that back on. So it was a norm for them to have these, these slight light makeups that they put, which we could say today is considered something like foundation. So it's foundation or um, like a very a natural type of makeup. And if you, met, if you hear the color that it mentions is usually yellow. Okay, so it's like a yellow like color. Yellow in that time ranged from like beige and cream and yellow type of colors. And we can understand that with their, with their skin tone, like the, the skin tone of the Arabs at that time. So that's something that's probably similar in, uh, to the color of their skin tone. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a type of makeup that they would put on. And for those who would cover their faces, obviously you wouldn't see it. But for those who didn't cover their faces, as we said, was also a norm of some of the Sahabiyat at that time. So it would be something that would be seen on the face of a woman. It was a light type of makeup, and it wasn't something that was overly, um, uh, you could say, caked on her face, right? It was enough that it was something that you could see it, but not too much that you wouldn't recognize who that person is. And so what scholars will say, those who allow light makeup, is they say it should be natural colors. It, sh it could be there to like cover up blemishes. That kohul is permissible. It shouldn't be something that really stands out again the, the marker should be that if she passes by, will someone like take a second glance and say, wow, like she really, really make, put, has, a, has a lot of makeup on. And so I'd say in regards to that, it shouldn't be any um, very bright colors. Okay, so again, the, the makeup that's mentioned for them was light makeup that was similar to the color of their skin tone. Similar to the color of their skin tone. So today we have makeup that is like bright purple lipstick and like bright green eyeshadow. And I would say that that goes to the category of not being moderate. That is not moderation necessarily in, in makeup because it's something that really pops out and um, you know, when, that, when a person is wearing it versus not wearing it, it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. And it definitely brings attention to her. Yes. So um, I think mas mascara, the, the scholars don't necessarily talk about that because it may not have existed at that time. But if it is something that is moderate, it is something moderate and doesn't greatly change the appearance, mascara can be put on in very different ways. You can have just one thing of mascara, it doesn't make a difference. And you can put on the very amazing L'Oreal types that like, you look like you have a different set of eyes or eyelashes. And so if you're, if you're on the side of caution, 
mascara is not within within the the ones that have been, been shown to us from the sunnah but if you are if you are going to go on the in terms of i'tidal moderation you can say a little bit of it may be acceptable also because it is the same color as the the hair of your eyelashes so that also goes back to the principle like it's the same color so if someone were to wear like something like lipstick there are certain colors that are not at all like the color of lips and then there are other colors which are similar to her lip color and so if you are going if you are going with the opinion that makeup that is natural that is not like eye catching then lipstick that is pretty much the same color of her, of her lips may be acceptable so like bright pinks and dark reds and things would definitely be out of the category of i'tidat. It would be out of the category of i'tidat. And we already know what, what those are because we, when we put them on, we're like, wow, yeah, that's very different. That's something that's just amazing. When you look at yourself in the mirror and it's definitely amazing, then you know that someone else will probably think it's definitely amazing and that's not the objective of, uh, of, uh, of a woman covering herself. Right, so a woman covering herself, the objective should be to not try to attract extra attention. To, to beautify herself, again, the Prophet says, what is wrong with beauty? Allah loves beauty. But to have i'tidal in it, to have moderation in it. Yes. Can, can a woman wear all those kind of makeup in a woman gallery? Yeah, that was my question. Good question. All of those types of makeup, anything you want, you can paint your entire face blue. That's all acceptable in front of her family in front of her mahrams, her brothers, her father, her um, uncles, etc. And in front of an all-women's gathering, completely acceptable. All types of makeup, all types of anything you want to do. In terms of dress, she should still dress um, modestly, but she doesn't have to cover, for example, her arm. So this is in front of women in her family. She doesn't necessarily have to cover her arms or below her knees. Okay. And it doesn't need to be extremely loose, it can be more fitted. But you also have to just be cognizant that if there are men there, like brothers and uncles, you should also have mod modesty in your dress because they are still men and it is also not appropriate to dress very provocatively in front of them. But generally the, the hijab is for strange men, so non-mahram men, non-mahram men. And the, the idea of light makeup is for in front of non-mahram men. Again, you can go with the opinion that no makeup is allowed, and that's an acceptable opinion. And like I said, there were men who, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, didn't allow their women to wear that. And that was an acceptable opinion. Yet the Prophet ﷺ was still like, what's wrong? What happened? Uh, there's actually another example. A woman come, came in to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and they, they meet her, and they said, she looked like something happened to her, like... She just, it was saying that she just looked like she was in a really bad state. There was like no beauty on her face or anything. Just something had happened. So they mentioned this to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ goes to her husband and said, Ma laka? Said, what, what's wrong with you? And then it just has dot, dot, dot. That they had some conversation. And it says, the wives of the Prophet say, then the next time we saw her, then she was beautified. We saw the, the yellow on her face and we saw like the kohol in her eyes and so she was in a different state and we were happy so they were just uh, obviously they were just really worried like what happened to her and that goes back to that the norm was women liked beautification and to a to a to a um, to a moderate degree they did do it and that if someone didn't do it it was sort of out of the norm and they thought something had happened to her maybe she's very sick or maybe a tragedy had occurred okay yes are you not So fake eyelashes, again, it wouldn't be something mentioned in books. Um, however, that can take us to the concept of hair. So the Prophet ﷺ, there's an authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentions like four or five characteristics that it says that Allah has cursed these people. And amongst those characteristics is um, a woman who, uh, not a woman, anybody who has a tattoo, who gets a tattoo, then Allah has cursed them. And anybody who plucks the eyebrows, then Allah has cursed them. And anybody who um, puts fake hair, hair extensions, then Allah has cursed them. And another one was that they, they, they file the teeth so that they look, they look smaller, like children's teeth. Now, that, that one's a strange one because it's not a norm of our society, but that was a norm um, of the uh, characteristics of the prostitutes at that time. 
So the women who were known as prostitutes, they had all these characteristics. They would wear hair extensions, they would wear wigs and things like this. They would pluck their eyebrows very thin. They would um, put, they would file their teeth down to look like they have like children's teeth because that was beautiful. And um, and the last one, I've forgotten now the last one. What is it? The tattoos. And this was the characteristics of the woman who was a prostitute. And so the Prophet ﷺ forbade women from trying to emulate that. And so from that, the question is, is fake eyelashes also similar to like putting a wig on? Because the eyelashes are related to the hair. And the hair, we're not allowed to have extensions. So again, I think it'll be an opinion. I haven't read up on it. I haven't read up on it because I, I haven't found any books that mention it. Because it's a pretty new phenomenon. Um, but I'd say... If someone, for example, maybe someone's suffering from something and their eyelashes have, they've lost their eyelashes, chemotherapy or something like that, then it would be, I would say, scholars would say there should be a permissibility for that person, for example, to, to put something that looks normal. Um, but for someone who, they already have normal eyelashes and Allah has blessed them with good eyelashes, so I would say, given that there's no necessary necessarily an opinion on it, it sort of seems to go back to a person who attaches extra to her hair to, to beautify the hair. Yes? What does it mean when you say that Allah has cursed them? What does it mean when we say that Allah has cursed them? It's a very bad thing. Uh, Allah alam what it means altogether. It is, it's sort of basically saying that that person is sinful. That person is sinful and um, uh, they would find out all altogether what the answer of that is, uh, you know, on the day of judgment. So it's definitely not a good thing. It's definitely a bad thing, and it is something that we should um, stay away from uh, if we have the ability to stay away from. Again, we said there might be a rukhsa, there might be a concession made for a person going through chemotherapy. They've lost hair or they've lost eyelashes, etc. So there may be concessions made for them. But I don't see any way that there's concessions made for tattoos, really. Um, How about eyebrows? Eyebrows. And eyebrows is an entire... Eyebrows are like, those, those are people with really things that we need to, in order to look at least presentable, you know, we I have to have some right. kind of um, shape going. You talk from the middle, uh, that's what uh, some, some opinions of the red. Yes. Okay, so the eyebrows. I'm glad you asked. Um, I mean, that shows you doing something for this group of this time. So, yes. Okay. So let me let me pre let me talk about what I've read about eyebrows and what's interesting is there's a lot there's a whole lot written about eyebrows. Um, so there's a hadith the Prophet ﷺ has which we just mentioned, which was cursed is the one who plucks the eyebrows. In addition to that was the one who plucks the eyebrows. So. The word, if there's a woman plucking your eyebrows for her, that person is also cursed. And in, in each of those cases, so the one who gives you that tattoo and the one who gets it. So in both cases, that person is cursed. Now, some scholars go strictly with that one hadith and say the opinion is that just stay away from it altogether. Do not do it. Do you want to incur the curse of Allah upon you? Like that is a very strong usage, right? The word curse is a very strong, the, the word was la'anatullah. La'ana. And we all know even in Urdu speaking uh, languages, we know la'ana is, is a very strong word. So those who were on the side of caution, they said just stay away from it altogether. Now, there is a question came from a woman, and a woman, and she had a husband, and she asked Aisha radiallahu anha, is it permitted for me to, to pluck my eyebrows if my husband wants me to? And Aisha radiallahu anha said, um, if there is, take away that which is um, unpresentable. Take away, you're permitted to take away that which is, in a sense, like sort of disfiguring or unpresentable. So now we have these two things. Definitely don't do it. And then Aisha understanding that, okay, if there's something that is very sort of, if someone has eyebrows that is very, very bushy, or that resembles a man's eyebrows, or they have normal eyebrows, but a few hairs stick out from like be below her eyebrow or above her eyebrow that are not, that sort of just stick out, outliers. So scholars made exceptions. Again, there's the, the opinion that no, not at all. And then there's the opinion that if a woman is married and her husband asks this of her, 
So this should be something, this could be something that is permitted, but it wouldn't necessarily be the shaping of the eyebrow. It would be to an extent where she's taking out the extra out, outliers, the things which are causing, you could say, disfigurement. Causing disfigurement. So it's, it's a little bit of an exception, but they said not to the extent where she's really thinning out the eyebrows, and now that is the imitation of the women of the, of the, the, the women who commit fahisha. The women who commit fahisha. In addition to this, we'll say there's another opinion that there's a, so that's the minority opinion, that it is permitted for a woman if her husband asks her to. They differ on would that woman have to wear niqab or not? So some say, well, then she has to wear a niqab uh, so, so that strange men don't see it. And others say, no, not necessarily, because she's not actually shaping it, but she's taking out the extra outliers. Then there's another minority opinion which goes like this, that what was the reason that the women were not permitted to do that at that time? Was because it was emulation of the zaniya. It was emulation of the prostitute. Prophet ﷺ didn't want them to emulate in any way the, the prostitutes. So the question is, is that still today, it, maybe in that time it was, is today plucking of the eyebrows a, something that is emulation of the prostitutes? And do women do it to emulate the prostitutes? So some say, if a woman is not doing it for that reason, that's not at all the reason she's doing it. She's not trying to emulate someone who is uh, an evildoer. And um, it's also not something that is, there's i'tidal in it, it's very moderate type of, of uh, taking away, then it may be permissible for her. It's still dangerous because we have la'natullah, but if, so basically they say someone who has very bushy eyebrows, someone who has eyebrows that they feel are like very disfigured, and they say perhaps they can take this minority opinion that she can, to a certain extent, shape them to what would be then considered normal, but not a thin line that is considered what we'd say, like trying to emulate um, the Zanya. And then um, finally, we have um, the opinion that the rest of the hair on the body is, I'd say, besides the eyebrows, so in between the eyebrows, the scholars said, yeah, that's permissible. The eyebrows. <laughs> so in between the eyebrows is permissible, on the face and different parts of the body is permissible. The eyebrows are where we have the catch. Okay, let's see. So when you say plucking, do you include like threading and waxing? Plucking, threading, and waxing are all under the same category. <laughs> um, so what, what scholars, what some scholars have accepted is shaving, shaving, cutting. So this is a, of the Hanbali Matam, that plucking was specifically what was not allowed. But shaving and cutting is permissible. So trimming. So say, for example, a woman has sometimes like this area is very high. The rest might be normal, but this is sort of like sticking out high. So if she were to cut it, it actually doesn't take it away from the root, but it's just shortened down this high area. So that is, the, is the, according to the Han minority opinion, is that is that that is acceptable. And bleaching the eyebrow, it's a new thing. So. It's, it's only been talked about a little bit, but bleaching it with colors that, that are not white has been made permissible, according to the minority. Bleaching it with colors that are white, some say it's allowed, some say it's not. Some say it's allowed because it's not plucking, and that was what was forbidden. Others say it's not allowed because you're, you're pretty much doing exactly what plucking would have done, and it's just like deceiving. A lot of this goes down to deceit. And I'll just give you a reason, like in the Hanbali Madhab, they say one really important thing is deceit. So what do I mean by deceit? Say um, 18 year old, okay, let's say like 23 year old girl, um, she threads her eyebrows or she plucks her eyebrows, and a man, uh, or a 25 year old man, okay, normal story, sees this woman as interested in this woman, talks to her parents like, I want to marry that woman. I want to marry that woman. And then they get married, and she has beautiful eyebrows, and then two months in, she gets very sick, and she's just unable to do her eyebrows, and all of a sudden, she looks very different from what she originally used to look like. That is where scholars say this is where it, is, this is where it would be considered deceit, that if a woman who's not married does it, to an extent that it's such a different, she looks like a completely different person, her eyebrows look very different, her husband may feel like, he was deceived ultimately, which is why plucking was not allowed, and even um, dyeing hair was generally allowed, 
but it was always said if a suitor comes to see a woman, or even if a suitor comes to see a woman, both the man and the woman, if their hair is dyed, they should make that known. This is not my original hair. You don't have to necessarily say that. You can show pictures of you as a child, like, oh, the hair is black and not the blonde I see in front of me, okay? Because that is a form of deceit for both men and women. So plucking, dyeing, Dying was considered acceptable. We can talk about dying in a, in a few minutes, the specific details about it. But it got, went back to rush, deceit. That you don't want to deceive someone to the point that when you wake up the next day after your marriage, you look like a different person. And that also goes back to makeup. That makeup that is moderate is okay. But if you wore such heavy makeup every day, the next day you wake up after the day you've gotten married and your husband doesn't recognize you, so there was deceit in that, right? There is some form of deceit in that. Um, as for makeup, women do love makeup. It's just something we have to remember and realize is that even without makeup, we are all beautiful. Everyone, no one realizes that, but Allah says, I created you in the most beautiful of forms. I created you as in the most beautiful of forms. And when we go to an extent where we're, um, and this is not related to the religion, but when we go specifically as women, we want to beautify ourselves, but we go to the extent when we are we're beautifying, our, beautifying ourselves so much that we don't really, we could not go outside of the house without it because we don't feel comfortable in who we are without it. So that's something we need to really think about and, and um, contemplate on in our lives. That have I accepted myself as beautiful because you all, you're all beautiful. Every single one of you are beautiful. And we need, to, we need to just internalize that. And if we internalize that, then the question of can I wear all of these different things, it's not that they'll be meaningless, but it, you'll, 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 you'll be more confident, confident in who you are when you come to that realization that Allah has beautified you and you are of the most um, ahsan, ahsan. Yeah, you, you are of, of the most beautiful creations that Allah has made. Okay? Um, but yes, in regards to that, I can't, I can't give a def definitive answer. Maybe we'll wait maybe 40 years before they come out with an opinion on that. These things have to happen and be put in society. The question has to be asked and the scholars make their opinions. Um, but I say generally go back to the concept of i'atida. And if there is disfiguration, then there is a permissibility to, to, to fix it. Okay. So I think go back to when you were talking about um, you know, girls can do or women can do or dress up however they want among themselves. And mm -hmm. then they have to keep a certain kind of modesty when they're out in public in front of men. So I personally find it very problematic uh, for multiple reasons. There's one that you're telling them that you're not normal, like you're not a woman, you are abnormal because you have to act a certain way in front of men who are not men of you, but you can act a certain, another way in front of women who are not non men right? So there should be a code among, like, you know, I'm sure there is, you know, among women, like, like how you should uh, conduct yourself to a strange woman because is women's environment safe for girls or for women? I don't think nowadays there is because we are living in a society where same-sex marriage is legal in a lot of states. And you know, these are the issues that you know, we are raising our girls. We have to address, we have to face this, and we have to, you know, like how are we going to do with it? So if I'm telling my daughter, you cannot talk to boys in your class, or you have to, you know, you know, act a certain way. But with girls, you can, I don't think I'm doing the wisest thing. If I'm teaching her that you have to uh, conduct a certain kind of modesty, among the boys and the girls, you can talk to them business or whatever, you know, you have to do with at school, that's fine. Same, and it's the same standard for boys and for girls. Then she probably will grow up with the mind that, you know, I'm a person, I'm not an abnormal, you know, that I could act a certain way in a certain group and the other way. So I'm not, you know, I don't want her to grow up with this idea of that, you know, like a conflicted personality, which happens a lot, you know, and it's happening a lot in uh, Muslim communities. You know, I moved from Boston, which is Massachusetts, a very different state than Texas. You know, very liberal. They, you know, they have different standards. And within the Muslim communities, we saw a lot of these kind of problems. Like it's just happening there. You know, and it's not that you know this is a problem of the the non-Muslim. You know, we have to own it. We have to like learn to deal with with the issue. So, so I guess my problem is, you know, one of the problem. With this, like you can, and then there's another aspect to that is like 
you know, it leads to voyeurism, basically. Like, you know, you can be whatever you want, and there's no end to that race of like, okay, I want to be different, so I'll do this, and I'll do that. Ostentatiousness, there's no end to that. You know, you'll see that a lot in South Asian communities. Maybe it's different with Arab communities, I don't know about other Muslim communities, but I've seen it a lot in South Asian communities, particularly in Pakistan communities. So how would you address that to the young girls who are here today? <laughs> So <coughs> and that's yeah, that's another very big topic. But but I think there have been like, you know for a lot of us, some of us who have like you know we do it job, we feel like really it's like a you know they are very good celebration. We can dress up whatever we like, and you know so it's like I think that like to some extent it's it's good to have like just uh, mm -hmm. women only gathering, and we can just feel free to dress as we <coughs> want. I mean at the same time the dress code when we are working as a professional and everything you know that should be different. So I mean, I mean, I think to a certain, I see your point. I mean, that's another like very big topic. Like we have real topic, real problem, real concern, especially with our youth. You know, going on with um, uh, um, uh, all the sexual orientation and all those uh, concerns. But I mean, you know, uh, I, I don't see that's not. This is not. Do you think it's not a real problem? No, because, because I mean, it's fast, it's fast, 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 you know, dressing up in you know, just a female gathering, like you know. Dressing up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I tell my daughter that, oh, okay, this is a, you know, now we can do whatever, I mean, however you want to dress up. I mean, but that's I why, if, for, if you know for sure about a woman, she's not a good character. You exactly. cannot, you, yeah. can, you have to dress modestly in front of her. So you need to know the woman. More or in terms of, you know, okay, stay away from kid or, or women who are. So you have to do a job. You job there's one more important question relating to the daughters. Uh, they go to gym and they have to change in front of other, you know, school friends. So, what? How would you guide them about it? It's a, it's a real time issue right now. So, if the girls are, I mean, they're so little. So they have to change. There is no other option. Another like little aspect to it. Okay, there's one more. Sure, sure. So, so in regards to so. When, when rulings are made, they go upon the majority, the majority, meaning, um, and I know it's different, the, the percentages will be different here than perhaps in a different era of homosexuality and things like that. But um, the, the ruling often goes up according to the majority. So if majority of women are of, of not a homosexual nature, then it should be, the, the rule is made based on that. That the majority of people are not um, inclining towards that, so it should be generally permissible that a woman um, can dress, um, does not have to wear her hijab and, and does not have to cover up as much in front of a group of women. However, um, if it is known like this that a, a per particular person has those tendencies, or a woman has felt uncomfortable in front of that woman in the past because of things they have said, then that person should take. Um, this is a personal personal decision to make extra, to take extra precautions in regards to that. Because, of course, it is something that exists and something that we should be cautious of. Cautious of. And so that could be put into the conversation. So we'll, to allow the, the girls that freedom that now it's a girl party, so you know you can wear that dress. It, it's also something like, if, if it's not supposed to feel that way, that, women, that Islam restricts and puts rulings on, on women, but if someone feels that way, when they're outside, like I can't wear that pretty dress that my friend, my friends are all wearing, but they get it for that specific girls pageant or girls ball that that the masjid hopefully in the future will will set up for the for the girls, then they can feel that that ability to feel that beauty and not have any uh, worries or qualms that um, she's doing something that she wouldn't be able to. So it, it's something I feel like is necessary. I know myself personally, like. I can't wait for girl parties because mm -hmm. just we want to dress up really nice. And you go, you go all out with everything that you do because that's the. Besides being in your home, you could do that anytime. But which is something that we should we should be encouraged to do. But it just it's just this feeling of of being able to dress up as much as you want. But if of course one must be cautious of those things and even make their daughters and their sons aware of these things that look this is something that has become. Still, the percentages are small, but it's something that's become acceptable and normalized in our society, um, homosexuality. So be on your guard if you feel like something uncomfortable. You're in a situation where someone is, is uh, uh, saying or looking at you in an uncomfortable way, saying something to you or looking at you in an uncomfortable way. So I, I you know, what you're saying is that there's two ways to go about you know, moderation. There's one way that you're really modest, you know, you 
don't let you just fly in when it's going to come And then you get all your, you know, you release all that energy that you have when you have your, you know, private party. And the other way is to go about it is you be yourself, you negotiate your moderation, that like you have your guidelines, and then you negotiate your moderation, that you not overly, you know, but you're, you know, you like to put in a presentable, you know, way, and then you just, this is the way you are, you are, this is the way you are in public, and this is the way you are in fact, you know, you don't change. So these are the, you know, that's what I'm getting from you. Sure. And I think I think that makes sense as long as that that i'tidal that you have chosen that moderation that you've chosen falls within the 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 bounds of the sharia then there's no problem with that. But I'd say even someone who chooses that and then I say there's like an elegant ball coming up, so surely they'll still want to dress up more and dress up more fancy and 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 want to and I say it's an all girls ball. Even if someone feels like I want to the same way I am in private and public, for something that has been given that opportunity to go all out. So, so people, it's in our nature as women to want to go all out, to want to go all out. But, but I agree with your stance that um, we shouldn't be, if we feel like we're creating an environment where people are having double personalities, then that is dangerous. That is altogether dangerous. I think a person, I think we shouldn't, as human beings, we shouldn't suppress ourselves to an extent where we have to completely like go out of control in a you know you, you long for a you know this is the time and the space where I can be myself you know I don't think we have to wait for that you can kind of you know negotiate a little bit and 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 based on the things that we've mentioned seeing what the women wore and how they dressed and and things like that we see that they did they did um, beautify themselves to an extent so they didn't suppress it all the way and those who did suppress it all the way. People looked at them, like the wives of the Prophet some looked at them and said, well, what happened to you? Because it was normal that a woman would have, would have had some sort of zina, whether it was kohod, whether it was the, the saffron on her face or whatever it may have been. So that was natural and normal, and it was acceptable for those who didn't, wear, who didn't uh, decide to wear the niqab. So that was acceptable for them to be in the public like that. Um, yes. Correct. Good question. Plastic surgery. Okay. So plastic surgery um, is actually under this topic, and I didn't mention that. Plastic surgery is pretty much you go you go on this base rule. We'd say it's generally not accepted. It's only acceptable as a concession for someone who has a deformity. So we even had, at the time of the Prophet saw a, a man who, during the battle, part of his nose was cut off during the battle. And now he has open an open wound, and it heals eventually, but it doesn't come back to the normal structure of the nose. The Prophet saw permitted him to put some metal, the shape of his nose, and then it, 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 it made him the proper shape of a nose. Similarly, um, someone whose teeth had come out, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi permitted them to put two false teeth so that it now looked normal, back to normal. And so the scholars say if there is an abnormality in a person um, that is considered, you'd say doctors consider it an abnormality and society would consider it an abnormality and it is something that's really psychologically detrimental to this person, uh, we say that it, the scholars permit that the plastic surgery in those cases. Are, are, so in regards to the nose particularly, so my teacher said, I mean there's no, there's no exact lines where you would draw the lines, but the line basically is like a, a, a doctor or uh, pretty much a doctor would consider that this is abnormal. So he said in regards to the nose, there are some nose shapes that we dislike, but it is within the, norm, the, the realm of normal. Right? Is it, it is within the realm of normal. In that case, the scholars say it is not permissible because in that case you are changing the creation of Allah. You are feeling that um, Allah has made me deficient. When this deficiency that, that women may see is actually, it might be beautiful to another person. Right? It might be beautiful to another person. So our teacher mentioned, for example, if a, ch a child or someone was born and their nose was like this. Okay, he just kept doing this example. He said, because that is something, nobody has that type of nose. It's not within, within the realms of normal. So that, that the mother or father could make the decision to have the, the nose fixed to become normal. If someone is born with a cleft, cleft, what is it called? Cleft palate. 
okay, where there's part of the um, skin is not fully formed on the lip, so they can have surgery to have it fixed. They mention in regards to someone gets into an accident or burned or anything like that, it's all permissible for that person to fix um, their body so that it is normal. Braces. braces were considered, braces are considered allowed by scholars because they say it's, it's a medical procedure for, for, for helping all together fix it. They say that... Sky is the limit. Yeah. I said Botox, this lift, that lift, tummy tuck. And so, and then, so, but then scholars do mention that. So they say, what about removing fat? Removing fat. So they say only if a medical professional deems it necessary for someone's health. Do you think it's going to be a consultation with a plastic surgeon? That's the doctor, right? Yeah. So he's going to tell you, yeah, you need it. So automatically, you know, the doctor will tell you, yes, you need it. Yeah. And if you go like, so I've got money, but this is business. Ask him this. Do I even find a doctor eventually? So, I would say don't ask a plastic surgeon. <laughs> Definitely ask your, your trusted family doctor. And what, again, what you're trying to find is, is, what, is this a disfigurement? So, like they say, if a, a child is born with a sixth finger, you could keep it or you would, it would be permissible to take it off. If someone is, one thing that they mention is like, someone has a wart on their face or a mole on their face, that would be something that there may be difference of opinion on it. For some people, you know, moles are beautiful and it's, and it's nice. What if someone has a mole that is this big on their face? And you'd say generally, this, the doctors will say there's nothing strange about it, it's completely normal. But generally all of society will, will look at that person and that person will never feel beautiful or they'll never feel confident. So they said if it's something that is, it is, it is very abnormal but still within the realms of normal, but it is something that so psychologically traumatizes this person that it leads them to depression or that it leads them to not wanting to show their face. For their mental well-being, some scholars, minority opinion, will say in that case, those would be acceptable, but we'd, we'd cut it off right there. Because once you open that door of what makes you feel comfortable, then the nose will be changed and the, the Botox will be put in, everything will be changed. Ultimately, the, like I said, the baseline rule is no, it's not allowed, unless for a concession for a deformity. And if it is, and we could consider a, like a big mole, the size of this is not a deformity, but society may consider that a deformity. Society may look at that and say, what happened to this person? There's something wrong with their face. Right? So in that case, um, they'd say there's a minority opinion that that would be acceptable. Others would say no, it's a mole, and that's normal, and the, the doctors would say that's not a disfigurement. Um, So nail polish, um, I've, I've, not, I've not seen any opinion that says nail polish is permissible while you, are, while you need to make wudu. Um, also, you know, all the question, plastic surgery. Okay. So plastic surgery um, is actually under this topic and I didn't mention that. Plastic surgery is pretty much, you go, you go on this base rule, we'd say it's generally not accepted. It's only acceptable as a concession for someone who has a deformity. So we even had, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man who, during the battle, part of his nose was cut off during the battle. And now he has open, an open wound, and it heals eventually, but it doesn't come back to the normal structure of the nose. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam permitted him to put some metal, the shape of his nose, and then it, 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 it made him the proper shape of a nose. Similarly, um, someone whose teeth had come out, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi permitted them to put two false teeth so that it now looked normal, back to normal. And so the scholars say if there is an abnormality in a person um, that is considered, you'd say doctors consider it an abnormality and society would consider it an abnormality and it is something that's really psychologically detrimental to this person, uh, we say that it, the scholars permit that the plastic surgery in those cases. Are, are, so in regards to the nose particularly, so my teacher said, I mean there's no, there's no exact lines where you would draw the lines, but the line basically is like a, a, a doctor or uh, pretty much a doctor would consider that this is abnormal. So he said in regards to the nose, there are some nose shapes that we dislike. 
but it is within the norm, the, the realm of normal, right? Is it, it is within the realm of normal. In that case, the scholars say it is not permissible because in that case you are changing the creation of Allah. You are feeling that um, Allah has made me deficient. When this deficiency that that woman may see is actually, it might be beautiful to another person, right? It might be beautiful to another person. So our teacher mentioned, for example, if a, ch a child or someone was born and their nose was like this, okay, this, he just kept doing this example. He said because that is something nobody has that type of nose. It's not within within the realms of normal. So that that the mother or father could make the decision to have the the nose fixed to become normal. If someone is born with a cleft cleft what is it called? Cleft palate. Okay, where there's part of the um, skin is not fully formed on the lip. So they can have surgery to have it fixed. They mention in regards to someone gets into an accident or burned or anything like that, it's all permissible for that person to fix um, their body so that it is normal. Braces. Braces were considered, braces are considered allowed by scholars because they say it's it's a medical procedure. For 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 helping all the other things. <laughs> they say that. Guys, the limit. I said both of this lift, that lift, tummy duck. And so and then so but then scholars do mention that. So they say, what about removing fat? Removing fat. So they say only if a medical professional deems it necessary for someone's health. The thing is, when you go for consultation with the plastic surgeon, that's the doctor, right? Yeah. So he's he's gonna tell you yes. Yeah. So, I would say don't ask a plastic surgeon. <laughs> Definitely ask your your trusted family doctor. And what again, what you're trying to find is is what is this a disfigurement? So, like they say, if a, a child is born with a sixth finger, you could keep it, or you would it would be permissible to take it off. If someone is one thing that they mention is like someone has a wart on their face or a mole on their face, that would be something that there may be difference of opinion on it. For some people, you know, moles are beautiful and it's, and it's nice. What if someone has a mole that is this big on their face? And you'd say generally, this, the doctors will say there's nothing strange about it, it's completely normal. But generally all of society will, will look at that person and that person will never feel beautiful or they'll never feel confident. So they said if it's something that is it is, it is very abnormal, but still within the realms of normal. But it is something that so psychologically traumatizes this person that it leads them to depression, or that it leads them to not wanting to show their face. For their mental well-being, some scholars, minority opinion, will say in that case, those would be acceptable, but we'd, we'd cut it off right there. Because once you open that door of what makes you feel comfortable, then the nose will be changed, and the, the Botox will be put in, everything will be changed. Ultimately, the, like I said, the baseline rule is no, it's not allowed, unless for a concession for a deformity. And if it is, and we could consider a, like a big mole, the size of this is not a deformity, but society may consider that a deformity. Society may look at that and say, what happened to this person? There's something wrong with their face. Right? So in that case, um, they'd say there's a minority opinion that that would be acceptable. Others would say, no, it's a mole, and that's normal, and the, the doctors would say that's not a disfigurement. Um, 